Operational Research versus Military Judgment The Problem of Technical Change in the British Infantry, 1943-1953 to A 38-minute presentation held in the Allenbrook Lecture Theatre at the Defence Academy, Shrivenham, on the 12th of November, 2008. The speaker is Dr Matthew Ford from the Defence Science and Technology Laboratories. I'm going to give you some of the research outputs that I came across whilst I was doing my own work. I was writing about technology change in the British Army from a practical perspective, how technologies really change in the British Army. There was a theoretical perspective that I was bringing to my thesis. It was based in the social shaping of technology, which has become quite prevalent in all things to do with technology change. The title of my paper is Operational Research, Military Judgment and the Politics of Technical Change in the British Infantry, 1943 to 1953. Military technology continues to provide a source of great fascination for the historian and political scientist. Often seen as a decisive element in war, the focus has moved away from a narrow interest in firepower towards a form of analysis that places technology within a framework of factors concerned with military effectiveness. However, only recently have a number of historians started the difficult task of systematically analysing tactical problems in ways that more precisely articulate the role played by technology on the battlefield. Typically, this will relate military equipment to the man using it, his training, morale and leadership, the geographical and climactic conditions he is fighting in, the logistical support available, and last but not least, the enemy themselves. It is rare, however, to find the same level of interest with regards to the way this matrix of issues affects the manner in which equipment decisions are actually reached in practice by the individuals involved. Rather, it is more usually assumed that technologies evolve according to their own logic, a logic that starts with the relationship between the offence and defence in battle and ultimately connects to some notional concept of a revolution in military affairs. According to this line of reasoning, ongoing technical change forces the military to adapt its tactics and modify its organisational practices so as to take full advantage of new equipment. Those armed forces that fail to understand the full implications of new technology face the risk of defeat in battle. By way of contrast, it is the ambition of this paper to start the process of revising this conceptual framework to show that the relationship between technology and military institution is more complex than the RMA theorists like to argue. By taking the example of the British infantry during and after the Second World War, this paper demonstrates how those war office and ministry supply personnel responsible for equipment decisions try to implement their vision. In particular, by examining the way in which the director of infantry sought to understand the battlefield and its tactical problems, it becomes possible to identify the way that he wanted the British infantrymen to fight. This analysis in turn shaped the conclusions he was reaching about equipment design. These decisions cannot be properly interpreted, however, without reference to their wider military and bureaucratic context in which they are situated. Certainly, the battlefield data generated by operation researchers could provide a battery of reasons for adopting particular equipment or ways of fighting, but they could not dictate the terms in which the army at large understood combat. Other members of the general staff had their own views, which had to be accommodated within a programme of technical change. Commanders of field formations could not simply be ignored. In these circumstances, weapon selection had nothing to do with the logic of the equipment and everything to do with the relative power of the groups concerned and the way in which arguments about equipment selection were framed. Through an examination of the Army's attitudes towards its small arms, what emerges is that there were a number of competing views about the nature of infantry combat. Different relevant groups had different ways of seeing the battlefield. The Director of Infantry, Major General Wilson, believed that the infantry should be equipped with a weapon that enabled tactical flexibility. Others, like General Richard Gale, Commander of 6th Airborne Division in Normandy and the 1st Airborne Corps after Arnhem, valued a tradition of marksmanship, one shot, one man. Considering their relative importance within the General Staff and their different points of view, there was nothing inevitable about the rifle choices that were being made. Indeed, the technical demands of the infantry can only be understood when seen in the light of these conflicting views of the battlefield. But it was neither the army nor the work conducted by operational researchers that finally clinched the arguments for new small arms. Issues identified by Winston Churchill came to have the most influence on what types of equipment would be selected. In particular, as far as the Prime Minister was concerned, it was more important to have access to the American manufacturing pool than it was to choose a system that met the needs of the army, as defined by various groups at the War Office. As will become clear, this meant Britain standardising on US patterns of equipment and, in effect, allowing Americans to determine what British infantrymen would eventually fight with. Given that the US Ordnance Corps also had a view on what weapons the US Army would need, Churchill's demands shifted the terms of the debate, introducing a level of institutional prejudice and organisational politics that neither operational research nor well-reasoned argument could overcome.
Such complexities are difficult to account for in the RMA thesis, but it is these human and bureaucratic factors that this paper seeks to examine more closely. The wartime debates on small arms properly started with the creation of the Director of Infantry in the spring of 1943. Prior to that time, the Weapon and Development Committee, under the Deputy Chief of the Imperial General Staff, dealt with small arms issues alongside all other equipment choices available to the Army. Given the technical problems armoured units were having with their tanks, it could come as no surprise that the infantry's needs were not priorities. With the appointment of the Director of Infantry, however, the Army had, for the first time in its history, an officer at the War Office who attempted to give the infantry a voice on a par with the other teeth arms, to quote Professor David French. Responsible for the equipment and manpower needs of the infantry, the DMF was part of the office of the DCIGS, at that time commanded by the former industrialist Lieutenant General Ronald Weeks. Compared to the office of the Vice Chief of the Imperial General Staff, who looked after operations and plans, the DCIGS was in charge of the wider effort to ensure that Britain's armies in the field had the appropriate means to defeat the Axis powers. The first officer to be appointed DMF was Major General TNF Wilson. Wilson was a Staff College graduate and a First World War veteran. As commander of 3rd Brigade in Alexander's 1st Division in France during the fighting in 1939-1940, he had been awarded a bar to his DSO following Dunkirk. However, it was his 1942 appointment to be Commandant of the School of Infantry and his subsequent move to become the first Director of Infantry in 1943 that established his importance in the development of small arms. In the first half of the war, the School of Infantry had worked hard to increase the technical competence of the citizen soldiers that now made up the bulk of the infantry. The central question that interested Wilson, once he had become DMF, was related to whether the infantry could or should be equipped with a firearm that might make it easier for these newly conscripted troops to take full advantage of their training. The School of Infantry had been born out of the battle school movement. These schools not only trained soldiers in how to deal with the battlefield environment, but were also instrumental in raising morale. The first of the battle schools had appeared in the summer of 1941 and was attached to 47th Division in the Southern Command. Other army training institutions were already in existence, but whilst outstanding, they were unable to cope with the demand produced by the rapid increase in wartime infantry numbers. Unsanctioned by the War Office and under the inspirational leadership of Lionel Wigram, a territorial army officer and former lawyer, the 47th Division Battle School filled a gap in the training regime which soon came to the attention of Southern Command's General Officer Commanding General Sir Bernard Paget. Impressed by the approach, Paget quickly moved to expand 47th Division's efforts by establishing an infantry-wide school of battle drill at Barnard Castle, County Durham in early 1942 after his appointment to command all home forces. Wigram was subsequently appointed the chief instructor for this new establishment and was given the task of training additional instructors for divisional schools that were then being formed. By the summer of 1942, battle schools had become so pervasive that the War Office decided to formalise the movement, renaming it the School of Infantry. The principal technique taught by the battle schools was a series of tactical drills. The objective of these was to explain to junior officers and NCOs the basics of fire and movement the central tenets of which were to manoeuvre in front of the enemy only when they were being suppressed by infantry fire or fire organic to the battalion. Thus, if two infantry sections were to mount an attack on a defended position, then one would be used to fire on the enemy, whilst the other moved forward, taking advantage of ground and cover to attack a flank. This practice, known as keeping one leg on the ground, was designed to stop opposition troops from returning fire on the manoeuvring section. If used properly, the technique had the potential to allow the infantry to find an advantageous position from which they could engage and then advance or outflank and eventually kill their foe. The training provided the infantry with standard drills, which they could fall back on when unclear about how to proceed. However, the system made considerable demands of the soldiers. Clearly, all concerned had to be sufficiently trained in the various techniques so that they understood before an engagement began how they would go about overwhelming the opposition. But there were also a number of additional factors that might limit the effectiveness of the approach. Firstly, soldiers had to be very fit so that they could carry at least a 9-pound rifle or a 22-pound light machine gun, plus large quantities of ammunition to a position on the battlefield from where they could engage with the enemy. And secondly, they needed weapons with a considerable weight of fire if they were to stand a chance of either suppressing or killing their opponent. As the Commandant of the Battle Schools, Wilson had recognised the importance of Wigram's efforts and been quickly converted to its pedagogical programme. However, even though the schools had appointed to the central problem facing the infantry in 1943, the DMF was new to the General Staff, and his ability to bring about changes in organisation or equipment was untested and consequently uncertain. Opposition to any proposals might come from two directions. The first and most serious came from forces in the field. By long-standing convention, unit commanders were free to organise and train their men dependent on the conditions that they faced. Accordingly, the DMF could not force his recommendations onto unwilling formations. 
The second but more manageable source of friction came from more senior officers at the War Office who could prevent change if they were not convinced by the Director of Infantry's arguments. From the beginning then, Wilson clearly understood that if he were to do anything about influencing army policy, he would need a bureaucratic device that could propose solutions that were based on the considered views of the British small arms community. This meant bringing together those responsible for training and equipment development and ensuring that their views were grounded in battlefield experience, preferably by relating it to data from the field. Potentially, this would give the DMF a powerful basis for challenging the received opinions of certain members of the general staff by legitimising the views of military and technical experts alike. At the same time, his recommendations would carry more weight with those field formations unwilling to adopt new modes of equipment or organisation. One of the first achievements of the new Director of Infantry was, therefore, to convince the DCIGS that a committee dedicated purely to the development of infantry weapons was required. This Standing Committee on Infantry Weapon Development, which first met in May 1943, included representatives of the Director of Military Training, Director of Military Intelligence, School of Infantry, Small Arms Schools, the Dominions, Field Formations and Home Forces, Ordnance Board and the Director of Artillery Small Arms, the Assistant Chief of Armament Design and Weapons Technical Staff from the Ministry of Supply. The committee's terms of reference were broad and included not only ensuring that our infantry weapons are superior in every way to those of any potential enemy, but also to forecast our own infantry tactics in relation to the enemies in order to assess the battle conditions under which weapons may be required. Within six months, the committee adopted a resolution calling for a better quality of weapon for the infantrymen. Previously, it had been necessary to produce as many firearms as possible so that the army would have enough to prosecute the war against the Axis powers. As a result, field formations had been compelled to fight with a variety of equipment that was sometimes of poor design, but more usually the result of failed quality assurance at the manufactory. With the appointment of the Director of Infantry, it was felt that the infantry above all arms and services have a right to expect the best in design, materials and workmanship, because their casualties on the battlefield are higher than those of any other service. The aim was clearly to try to restore the confidence of the soldier who for much of the war had been compelled to use substandard or very old equipment. By the summer of 1943, with some insights provided by the battle schools and a bureaucratic device for challenging received opinion at the War Office, Wilson was in a position to alter the makeup of weaponry at the section level. However, neither fellow staff officers nor field formation commanders were likely to accept modifications to equipment unless there were sound reasons for doing so. Consequently, Wilson had to make extensive use of operational research in order to furnish him with the arguments that might help him make a case for change. As Watson Watt, the inventor of radar, described it, operation research examines quantitatively whether the user organisation is getting from the operation of its equipment the best attainable contribution to its overall objective. What are the predominant factors governing the results at a minimal cost in effort and time and the degree to which variations in the tactical objectives are likely to contribute to a more economical and timely attainment of the overall strategic objective? By systematic surveys of units in the field, examinations of after-action reports and experiments on the rifle ranges, evidence was being made available to the DMS committee revealing that what equipment worked well under various organisational climactic conditions. The data indicated the DMF and the Committee of Infantry Weapon Development the need for reliable, lighter weapons with increased rates of fire, especially at the point of the final assault. At the start of the war, the typical British eight-man infantry section carried seven rifles and one Bren light machine gun. The well-trained riflemen armed with a number four could, in the right circumstances, fire 15 shots per minute. The Bren gun was magazine-fed and typically loaded with 28-rimmed 303 cartridges. Manned by two men, if the bipod was being used, it could theoretically fire between 450 and 550 rounds per minute. In practice, however, fire was often limited by the number of replacement barrels available and the amount of ammunition the rest of the infantry section could carry. Indeed, as one infantry commander observed, in the attack, the rifleman seldom uses his rifle, being mostly employed as an ammunition carrier for the Bren. The Bren had a tripod attachment that could be used for sustained fire and to increase the accuracy of the weapon, but it was rarely found in the forward battlefield areas. Therefore, depending on the quality of the men and the amount of ammunition carried by the section, nearly half of the firepower could be generated from just the Bren gun team. In terms of fire and movement, this usually meant that the Bren was more useful when sighted in such a place as to provide covering fire for the rest of the section advancing to attack the enemy. According to Major General Wilson, the overall tactical objective was to ensure that all the available infantry weapons were brought to bear upon the enemy, not only in the initial stage of the advance, but also up to the last possible moment, so that the infantry can literally be shot into close quarters. Bearing in mind the difficulties associated with ensuring troops reach the battle in an order appropriate for this type of engagement, research by Lionel Wigram indicated that this tactic was unlikely to happen in practice. 
A more common occurrence might be for several sections to mount an attack with two or more Bren guns, providing cover for the rest of the riflemen or for men to ignore battle drill entirely. In either case, however, the ability of the infantry to fire and move according to the needs of the battle was restricted in part by the way in which men were armed with different types of weaponry. The Bren being heavier was more suitable for firing from a fixed position. The rifle was more mobile but designed for engaging targets at a distance and without a sufficient rate of fire was inappropriate for combat at close quarters. Ideally, a solution would be found that gave troops a weapon that had the firepower advantage of the Bren and the weight advantage of the rifle. The answer, according to the operational researchers, was to change the distribution of weaponry within the section such that more men were armed with the Sten gun. There were several reasons underpinning this suggestion. Firstly, lighter Sten guns were more useful to troops on the attack, where battlefield tempo demanded that a soldier had to move quickly and stop rarely to take deliberate aim at an inconspicuous enemy. The machine carbine was a weapon designed for close quarter combat, but research showed that at ranges of up to 200 yards, its high rate of fire gave the man using it a higher chance of hitting his target than if he was armed with a rifle. Secondly, theoretically capable of firing in the region of 500 rounds per minute, and with a total weight of under 7 pounds, depending on the version, the Sten was considered to have as much value as the Bren light machine gun at ranges of up to 300 yards. Finally, because of the small size of its ammunition, arming most men in the section with a Sten gun did not present any logistical issues. With a weight equivalent to a rifle and 50 rounds, the men armed with a Sten could carry up to 128 rounds. Bearing in mind that artillery support was often available, the infantry could typically advance to within assaulting range of the enemy, 100 yards distance, without need of their own long-range battalion weapons. Medium machine guns and light machine guns would still be necessary in defence or for helping troops manoeuvre, but the weight of evidence suggested that more advantage would be gained from exchanging the number four rifle for the Sten. Where specialist skills permitted, one man might usefully be equipped with a sniper rifle, but otherwise the section could be turned over to weapons with higher rates of fire. According to the operational researchers then, the Sten could provide the tactical flexibility required by the infantry. Unfortunately for the Director of Infantry, it was not clear, however, whether he might be able to persuade his War Office colleagues as to the efficacy of any of these ideas. For opposition to Wilson's proposals to change the equipment and organisation of the Infantry Battalion came early in his time as a Director of Infantry. For example, in July 1943, following a trip to First Army in the Middle East, Wilson gave the Standing Committee on Infantry Weapon Development the opportunity to discuss whether the Vickers ought to be a battalion, brigade or divisional weapon. Having come to the conclusion that there was a sufficient supply of these weapons available for issue to battalions, the Director of Infantry took his recommendations to the DCIGS. At this meeting, Wilson accepted the convention that commanding generals ought to decide how to deploy their forces, but pointed out that battalion commanders had wanted the vicars as part of their resource pool. According to Wilson, the general staff ought to recommend that it become a battalion weapon. The Director of Staff Duties and the Director of Military Training did not, however, agree, arguing that the reorganisation of medium machine guns into brigade support groups had only just been decided. They believed that commanders in the field should implement those recommendations without any further changes. It seemed that certain members of the General Staff refused to accept the role of the DMF, who was now making it his job to assess the evidence and craft the infantry into a more effective tool. Wilson's problems did not end there, for field formations also signalled a lack of enthusiasm for changes to the existing distribution of small arms. The main reason for this was that a sizable number of unit commanders still believed that the rifle was the most appropriate weapon for service, irrespective of the battlefield evidence to the contrary. Undoubtedly, they reasoned, that the most effective infantryman was one who, like a marksman, could make every shot count, one shot, one kill. However, many in the small arms community recognised that this preference did not necessarily reflect a rounded understanding of either the equipment or the most appropriate way to use it. In particular, reports from surveys conducted within 18 Army Group at the end of the Desert Campaign demonstrated that battalion commanders were not necessarily qualified to comment on the weapons being used on operations. The DMF and the committee remained wedded to the idea of providing troops with a fully selective fire weapon like the Sten. Nonetheless, the Director of Infantry could not simply impose changes on field formations. Instead, he had to find solutions that their commanders would be happy with. Accordingly, the initial response of the Committee on Infantry Weapon Development was to reluctantly pursue the development of a self-loading rifle. Whilst this proposal ran counter to the work being conducted by operation researchers, the idea was clearly inspired by feedback coming from Field Formation HQ, still wedded to the number 4 rifle. As compromises went, a self-loading rifle had the potential to increase the volume of fire a soldier could generate without sacrificing the range or the marksmanship skill this necessitated. The only sticking point for the DMF was the nature of ammunition then available to Britain. Rimless cartridge cases made an automatic weapon more reliable by reducing the number of failures generated through misfired ammunition.
Given that Britain's armies were using 303 rimmed cartridges, producing sufficient ammunition and weapons to replace the number four whilst in the middle of war was recognised by the DCIGS to be impractical. As a result, the idea for a British self-loading rifle could get no further than the prototype stage. Changing to some kind of automatic infantry weapon designed for issue to every soldier would have to wait until after the war when the technical problems associated with its ammunition could more easily be sorted out. So, in 1946, with the pressures of war production fading away, it was possible for the War Office to re-examine the whole small arms question. Given the tactical requirements, the technical response from the Ministry of Supply was simple. A lighter rifle would enable the soldier to more easily bring it to bear on the target. But if increased rates of fire were a necessity and ammunition remained a large calibre, then a future weapon would have to be heavier so that it might absorb recoil energies more effectively. Bearing in mind the laws of physics, the only realistic way to develop a lighter rifle with increased rates of fire was to move to a smaller calibre round. This would reduce the recoil generated and allow the soldier to carry more ammunition. However, if the general staff chose an existing round, then there was the possibility that they might also select an already available rifle. Such a decision would be disastrous for the Director of Infantry and Ministry of Supply, who believed that the calibre of ammunition and weapons on hand were either appropriate for close-quarter fighting or engaging targets at range, but not necessarily both. Accordingly, if the Director of Infantry was to have a weapon that had the range performance of a rifle, but was both lighter and capable of generating fully automatic fire, then he would need a new type of ammunition, whilst showing that other varieties were unsuitable. Aside from creating something new the general staff had a choice between two tried and tested rounds. The first was the Continental 792 ammunition used in the Beza tank machine gun. The second was the American 3006 round used in a number of US small arms, including the M1 Garand. Because of the wartime difficulties associated with ammunition manufacture, the DCIGS did not believe that adopting the 792mm round was the most appropriate solution for the British Army going forwards. Accordingly, it was the US 36 round that was most likely to upset the ambitions of the Director of Infantry. The 3006 was originally designed for the Springfield rifle, a weapon that was in many respects an Americanized version of the Mauser K98. Designed to hit targets at range, the Springfield was ideal for the marksman, but it was not suitable for close quarter engagements, nor was its ammunition appropriate for use in light automatic weapon. Unfortunately for the Director of Infantry, however, as of March 1943, it had been general staff policy to adopt a future type of ammunition common to that of the Americans. In practice, this meant that the British Army would adopt US weapons as soon as the war ended. This decision predated the creation of the Standing Committee on Infantry Weapon Development and reflected the difficulties faced by the armed forces in acquiring sufficient quantities of arms and ammunition. Nonetheless, it placed the Director of Infantry in a difficult situation. For his arguments against the 306 calibre effectively put him at odds with official policy. The challenge, therefore, was to bring staff policy into line with the thinking of the Director of Infantry and the Committee on Infantry Weapon Development. The starting place was to point out the inadequacies of the 3006 round. However, an argument that began with the claim that the American ammunition would not enable tactical flexibility was not a line of reasoning that carried much weight with the DCIGS, for there were many officers who were still committed to the marksmanship tradition embodied in the No. 4 rifle and made possible by the 3006 round. Instead, the Director of Infantry had to find a number of other reasons that supported his case for change, the most powerful of which related to how adopting US weapons would affect British unit structures. The Ministry of Supply furnished him with the key points when design engineers pointed out that it can be said in general that American weapons are technically efficient. Since, however, organisation is fundamentally based on weapons, whether individual or demanding a weapon team for their maintenance in action, unless British and American organisations and tactical employment can be brought into line, it is difficult to assess the battle-worthiness of American weapons vis-à-vis -vis our own. Instead of the 306, the DIMP proposed an alternative 280 calibre round then being worked on by the Ministry of Supply. With a smaller bullet and less propellant than existing ammunition, the 280 made it possible for the design establishments to build a lighter rifle that would permit full automatic fire without compromising robustness or reliability. Furthermore, if the general staff might agree on a bullpup configuration, then the weapon would retain a barrel of comparable length to that of the number 4. This weapon, known as the experimental model number 2, would make it possible for the infantry to engage targets at range as well as fight at close quarters. Finally, because this new rifle had been created with the British infantry in mind, it would not compromise the Army's current mode of organisation. In effect, the ammunition and equipment options suggested by the Director of Infantry would satisfy the concerns of those Second World War commanders interested in marksmanship and eager to retain the number 4 rifle, whilst providing the infantry with a degree of tactical flexibility they had not previously enjoyed. The logic of the counter-proposal did not, however, eventually swing the argument towards the DIMF. Rather, it was uncertainty about U.S. intentions that created the circumstances in which the DMS proposals became attractive. 
Given staff policy, the priority for the DCIGS had been to bring about ammunition standardisation with the Americans. This was a plan that was supported by intelligence from the British Joint Services Mission to Washington, who indicated in the spring of 1946 that US military authorities would retain 3006 ammunition for some years to come. By late July, however, additional information coming from the BJSM suggested that the US Ordnance Corps were on the verge of developing a new round. Therefore, if the British went ahead and adopted the 36, they would be prematurely moving to an already redundant class of ammunition. At the same time, there was some indication that the US would not change over to its new standard until either it had run down existing stocks of its 306 or a new military emergency occurred. The DCIGS was left in an extremely difficult situation. Charged with implementing the General Staff's policy on ammunition, it seemed that the DM's proposals were the only realistic options on the table. The problem was that the General Staff's wartime decision to standardise also left the Americans free to decide what equipment they would adopt without reference to the wishes of the British Army. In effect, therefore, the US Army would also have to find the DM's proposals persuasive if they were to do anything other than select equipment designed by their own ordnance establishments. But whilst the Americans might agree that a weapon capable of full automatic fire was appropriate for battle, they were certainly not convinced by the British decision to introduce a smaller calibre of ammunition. This point had been made explicit during a 1946 meeting of the US War Department Equipment Board, known as the Stillwell Board, after its chairman. During the course of investigations, the decision was taken to replace the Garand, but maintained the 30 calibre. The new rifle would be lighter than the M1, capable of selective semi-automatic and automatic fire, and have the ballistic performance equivalent to that of the present rifle. The board wanted greater firepower, lighter weight, but was not prepared to sacrifice their commitment to the 30 calibre ammunition to achieve it. As the British knew well, however, if engineers were to build a fully automatic firearm utilising large bore ammunition, then the weapons component parts would have to be made more robustly, which in turn would make everything heavier. Clearly, lighter weapons were not of particular concern for the Americans. Of more interest was the issue of ammunition lethality. As far as the Americans were concerned, ammunition selection turned on identifying what constituted an appropriate criterion for wounding. Since the turn of the 20th century, it was believed that in order to achieve incapacitating results, small arms ammunition had to strike the target with at least 58 foot-pounds of kinetic energy. Whilst British operational researchers were finding that the evidence did not support this claim, Americans continue to view kinetic energy as the most appropriate wounding criterion. Research started in September 1943 at the behest of the U.S. Army Medical Corps by a group of Princeton academics found that the study and measurement of temporary wound cavities show that the total volume of the cavity is proportional to the energy delivered by the missile. Whilst there was still some uncertainty about the exact value of kinetic energy required to incapacitate, as far as the U.S. Ordnance Department were concerned, the academic research did not undermine the case supporting the 58 foot-pound criterion. However, evidence collected by the British anatomist Professor Solly Zuckerman during the Second World War challenged the view that kinetic energy explained wounding power. In his work examining cadavers and bomb blasts from a number of campaigns ranging from France and Flanders to the Blitz in the Mediterranean, Zuckerman observed that victims mainly suffered incapacitating wounds from small pieces of shrapnel. Of even greater significance was the finding that smaller sized shrapnel could still be lethal. Kinetic energy by itself could not explain these phenomena some other physical characteristic or property had to be relevant. According to Zuckerman, wounding potential was more related to the projectile's velocity than it was to its kinetic energy. This implied that increasing the speed of a projectile could increase the probability of hospitalization. As a result, ammunition design ought to focus on projectile velocity as opposed to kinetic energy. If correct, this had massive ramifications for anyone wanting to develop a firearm that used smaller ammunition. This was because the research suggested that, relatively speaking, a small, faster projectile had more kinetic energy and was therefore even more destructive than a large, slower one. Unfortunately for the British, Zuckerman's research was not sufficient to convince the American ordnance experts that their own interpretations were wrong. For the matter was not going to be resolved by scientific proof alone. This was because U.S. ordnance officials had their own rifle in development that they wanted the U.S. Army to adopt, and they were not prepared to concede anything that might jeopardise their own chances of success. Accordingly, they worked hard to undermine the British arguments with regards to lethality. If velocity was so important, they asked, then why did the new British ammunition have such a low muzzle velocity when compared with current standards? The British response was that they had designed their ammunition to work in lighter weapons suitable for close-quarter battle and engagements under 300 yards. The Americans countered by stating that the ammunition had to match the existing US 3006 round and be capable of engaging targets at 2,000 yards with a striking energy of at least 87.57 foot-pounds. Only 3.0 caliber ammunition, they argued, could achieve this. 
What became clear in the exchange is that the American view of the contemporary battlefield was significantly different from that of their British counterparts. Whereas the British believed that it was necessary for the infantry section to have an increased volume of aimed fire for engaging the enemy at short ranges, the Americans clearly did not. Different interpretations of the battlefield and questions about lethality were, however, only a couple of areas where the two sides took opposite views. At a more fundamental level, underlying the different perspectives were simple organisational truths that were not always well articulated by all concerned. For the British, logistical considerations dictated that the soldier carried as much as he could on his person, marched into battle and often fought at the end of an extended supply chain. The Americans, by contrast, were often transported to the battlefield by truck or jeep and could rely on an extensive logistical support to ensure that sufficient ammunition was always available. As one commentator put it, the US infantry lives off or near to and moves in jeeps, peeps and lorries. The British infantry's mobility is the mobility of the man on his feet. This fundamentally different attitude to infantry is at the root of the different approach to this rifle. In these circumstances, the US Army could happily use a larger caliber round because there were no issues about its size and weight or getting it to the right place. The British, by contrast, did not have this luxury. Unfortunately, however, neither did the British have the luxury to ignore US protestations once the Labour government decided to follow the advice given to it by the Chief of the Imperial General Staff, Field Marshal Slim. For when it was announced in the House of Commons on the 25th of April 1951 by Emmanuel Shinwell, the Secretary of State for Defence, that the army would adopt the EM2 regardless of US opposition, what previously had been a private dispute between expert officials suddenly went public. Consequently, the Conservative opposition had the opportunity to cross-examine the government on the decision and argue that access to US manufacturing capabilities was more important than battlefield realities. If it had not been for Winston Churchill's re-election in October 1951, the army might have got their way. However, with a new government in power, what insulation the war office had previously enjoyed was suddenly removed. As far as the new Prime Minister was concerned, the EM2 might well have been the best rifle available, but given the logistical implications of automatic weapons and the problem Britain had faced in manufacturing sufficient ammunition during the war, he was unconvinced by the War Office's arguments. He wrote, There is no doubt that the 280 is a far better rifle than the 303. It may well be technically the best so far designed. The rate of fire is not, however, important or usually an advantage. The existing rifles can fire away more ammunition in 10 minutes than the soldiers can carry. Indeed, the practical problem has been, and I believe still is, to husband the use of ammunition by the forward troops. The Prime Minister believed nothing should be done that might jeopardise British access to the US armaments industry. This included selecting a weapon that the Americans were unwilling to make use of themselves. Unsurprisingly, Slim did not view the production issue in quite the same way as the new Prime Minister. This belied the fact that at a deeper level, Slim's concerns were not related to manufacturing at all, but rather with defending Britain and Western Europe in future conflicts with the Soviet Union. Slim believed the EM2 to be the most appropriate weapon in the circumstances, and he wanted to ensure that his troops were issued with it. Indeed, he stated that the best way to demonstrate the virtues of the EM2 was for the British Army on the Rhine to be issued with it so that it could demonstrate its worth. What the CRGS could not do, however, was simply ignore the new Prime Minister in the hope that military judgment and operational research would will out over a head of government who had redefined the problem to include questions concerning manufacturing capacity. It fell on Slim, therefore, to try and win Churchill round to the Army's way of seeing things. Accordingly, at a meeting in Downing Street on November 20th, 1951, the CIGS discussed the matter with the Prime Minister, the Secretary of State for Defence and Lord Churwell. During this tempestuous meeting, it was made clear to Slim that access to American manufacturing capacity through standardised equipment selection was an imperative of the new government. In a subsequently heated exchange, Churchill apparently resorted to his own military experience to substantiate his point, stating that, when I was at Omdurman, I rode with a sabre in one hand and a revolver in the other, <laughs> to which Slim apparently retorted, not much standardisation there, Prime Minister. As far as Churchill was concerned, access to the US manufacturing pool was more important than the infantry's attitude toward battlefield tactics, the problems of logistics or the science. Clearly, battlefield needs were one thing. Churchill and his views on the strategic relationships Britain needed in order to sustain a long war, something else entirely. So to conclude... What light does this study cast on the RMA thesis? Well, first, a word of caution. One historical case study is hardly sufficient to bring down the entire RMA edifice. Indeed, it could be claimed that the small arms are a mature technology and therefore not particularly revolutionary. Yet the debate over replacing the bolt action number four with a fully automatic fire weapon clearly constitutes a fault line along the supposed firepower revolution that started with the magazine rifle in the 1880s. Arguably, then, there are elements in this story that suggest more caution is required when attempting to explain socio-technical change within a military organisation.
This is most clearly demonstrated by the fact that the inspiration for the EMT was not, of and by itself, born out of experience in real battle. Rather, the development of British small arms technology was, at least initially, stimulated by a desk-bound officer within the War Office bureaucracy. It was Major General Wilson and his views on fire and movement that really provided the leadership necessary to bring about change. Battlefield data and operational research subsequently provided the evidence to support the idea that lighter weapons with greater firepower were desirable. New firearms were not, however, something of particular concern either to staff, officers at the War Office, or field formation commanders. No amount of clever argument could get round the fact that some very influential officers, including Montgomery himself, were wedded to a different view of the battlefield, one that emphasised the artillery-dominated set-piece attack. Some commentators have argued that there were good organisational reasons for this conservative approach to minor tactics. Regardless, these competing interpretations ultimately restricted the DMF's ability to introduce new small arms into the army. Only with the end of the war could the matter be considered once again. By this time, though, the problem was more related to American views on ammunition lethality than on tactical flexibility. If the inspiration for the EM2 did not start with battlefield data, then a more sophisticated line of reasoning might be that tactics were driving technical change. At first sight, this certainly looks to be the case. However, the weapon that emerged from these tactical debates was not actually accepted into service. Contingent events like the re-election of Winston Churchill shifted the terms of the British post-war small arms debate and ultimately made competing bureaucratic imperatives more important to weapon selection than the logic of the DMF's argument. Whilst there may have been sound arguments underpinning Churchill's position, none of them make it possible to claim that there is a simple causal link between battle and the type of equipment that actually gets selected. The RMA thesis is, as a result, in need of re-evaluation if it is to fend off the questions raised by the British Army's decision to abandon the EM2. Specifically, this case study suggests a more sophisticated way of looking at the relationship between tactics, technology and the military bureaucracy, one that factors in the politics of technology selection. Basic questions that such an analysis would have to address include identifying the individual groups or actors who have a view on the battlefield, the tactical problems they define and the appropriate socio-technical responses they believe are required in order to solve them. This would undoubtedly reveal how different groups within the military organisation perceive battle and how they may or may not work with each other in order to resolve the dilemmas identified. Finally, because the investigation would tightly link named individuals or groups to their technical preferences, the values and beliefs of these actors would be exposed for further examination and their particular views on what it is to produce military effectiveness laid bare. That said, what conclusions might be drawn from this case? Well, bearing in mind the fact that scientific argument could not compel technical change, one conclusion that seems plausible relates to the need to account for the way powerful groups within the military bureaucracy use their influence. As this example has shown, it was only by engaging with key personnel that the DMF had a chance of building a successful case for new weaponry. That he ultimately failed in his endeavour might more reasonably be explained by a lack of powerful allies than with any unsoundness in his reasoning. Dr Ford can be contacted by email at Matthew, spelt Mike Alpha Tango Tango Echo Whiskey, dot Ford, at kcl.ac.uk.